Okay, and welcome back, everybody. It's about 12.45. I'll give folks another 10, 20 seconds or so to sort of get back in a comfortable position. We had um, a lot of content this morning sharing. I'm going to stop for just a moment. Uh, Jesse. Oh, Jesse. Okay, Jesse, I'm ready when you are. Thanks. All right. We are going to start talking about read aloud. Um, so we've talked about uh, intro to centers and centers, um, as well as thinking and feedback. And um, a lot of, you know, the themes and topics come from our read alouds, which is our, which are our cortex for um, the program. So just to give you a little bit of the background um, about how the read aloud component was established. So we know that reading is fundamental in early childhood. In pre-K for me, we read how we read and what we read is based on research and intentionally supports vocabulary development and story comprehension. Our core texts are chosen for their complex plots, interesting characters, and challenging vocabulary. These core texts anchor the other components in the curriculum to enhance an interest, comprehension, and vocabulary development in learning experiences throughout the day. Um, so Sarah um, talked a little bit about some of the activities that are in unit one. So we saw her making collages like is done in the illustrations in Peter's chair. So that's just one example about how that read aloud directly connects to the activities in the classroom. And I guess I can say that we there are four reads of each of the core texts. Um, they all are different from one another and you'll see sort of how that plays out. Um, we're gonna start with read one. Great. All right. Hi guys. Hold on, I gotta situate myself. Okay. So read one is the orientation. So I need to remind myself to speak slowly like I do with my students because I can talk to kids, but adults is a different story. <laughs> so I will remind myself to speak a little slowly. Um, teachers introduce the story problem and main character using the illustrations from the book cover. So right here I have Peter's chair. This is the second book that you'll read in um, unit one. Um, and I'll show you how to introduce this in just a minute. Um, while reading the story, teachers support vocabulary by using expression, pointing, and gesturing. And we'll talk more about those as well. Teachers will support understanding by using comprehension asides. Hold on one second. Okay. Yeah, you can go to the next slide, Nicole. All right. So what I'll do first is I will introduce this story. Um, actually, we're going to go through a, <laughs> a second read, so I'll do it then. But before you begin reading your story, you're going to want to familiarize yourself with your stories. Um, you will be reading them a lot but it's a good thing to go over them a few times before you actually start. One of the first things you'll want to do is go through the story and choose five to 10 vocabulary words to enhance, and then also choose your strategy on how you're going to do that. So you will use either pointing, gesturing, or voice expression. Short definitions can be used only on words that can't be defined by other strategies. Um, so te some teachers have different techniques that they use for their vocabulary words. What I typically do is I will go through and I'll use a pencil and I will lightly underline the words that I know that I want to um, enhance. Some teachers will write their words on a post-it note and stick it on the back of their book and keep it there. And that jogs their memory on what um, words they want to use. You will become so familiar with these books that eventually you won't need any reminders. You'll know exactly what you want to do when you get to those words. Um, so you'll, again, just find what works best for you. Um, I would just, 
Um, so it sounds like you're like you have a lot to do and a lot to figure out, but these lessons really outline it for you. Yeah. So all of the there there are suggested scripts. Um, so in the lesson plan itself, you will see, um, you know, words that you might want to use for vocabulary words or those words that you want to enhance, as well as all of the script for any comprehension asides um, or any other emphasis you want to make while you're reading. And that's all on the website, and we will show you um, more about that tomorrow. Um, so research shows that children will remember the first definition they hear. Research also shows this for Mrs. Gallagher. So for this reason, we do not ask the children what a word means. Instead, we provide the correct definition for them. Um, comprehension asides are teacher comments throughout the story to explain an illustration. The character's emotional state or indicate what a character may or may not know. So for example, in Peter's chair, there's one part where um, Peter is upset and uh, Willie, his dog, doesn't know why he's upset, but he's licking his face to try to make him feel better because he knows something is wrong. That's where you might pause and explain what's happening in the picture. That would be a comprehension aside. Um, we also will model analytical thinking when it's appropriate. So we, you will use the words I'm thinking. And a lot of times I will combine my comprehension asides and my analytical thinking, or they just happen to go together. And I'll demonstrate that for you when I do the second read. Um, after the first read, ask inferential questions about something that is not specifically stated in the text to deepen understanding of the story. So in your script in on the website, um, at the end of each read, there are a set of questions, of analytical que questions that you can read. Um, you might not have time to read all of them. That's also something I suggest going over beforehand and deciding which questions might be best for your class. Um, you might not have time to ask them all, but there are some that you're definitely going to want to fit in. Um, and then again, if there's something else that you feel like you need to ask for your class to help the, uh, them get a deeper understanding, then you can go ahead and do that too. Answering these types of questions will help explain the character's emotions actions and or motivations. Then model appropriate analytical thinking if children do not respond, which I'll show you as well. Um, do you have anything else for first read? I don't think so other than, so this is like the first time that these kiddos are experiencing the story. So that's why there's not a lot of pausing or comprehension aside. It's like, um, you're just gonna read through the text. Maybe there's some expression or, exaggerations that you want to include um, to help with vocabulary enhancement, mm -hmm. but this is a first read. It's a dry read. You're just reading through the whole story. Got it. Okay. We'll move on to second read. Okay. So here is where you're going to get a little deeper into um, the vocabulary, a little deeper into that analytical thinking. So the teacher fully reads the story a second time, reinforcing what children already know and extending their knowledge of vocabulary and plot. And I would just add, Morgan, that the second read is on a different day, mm -hmm. right? It's not like right after the first read. It's nope. a whole nother lesson plan for a different day. Right, so that's a good point. So each day you're going to be reading one read aloud um, for one of our core read alouds. You may be reading another story in a different part of the day, like in Swipple, sometimes we'll read a story, but your read aloud in the morning is what your activities for the day are. So this is what your centers are based on. Um, so you're going to read, for the first week we have Cry Baby and we have Peter's Chair. You're going to take turns reading those. It will tell you in your schedule, the first day you will read Cry Baby first read. The second day, day two, you're reading Peter's Chair first read. Then day three, you're reading Cry Baby second read. Um, so follow your schedule because your, the rest of your day depends on what you're reading. All right. The focus is on further clarifying points of confusion. So add more information to students' responses when necessary. Continue to define vocabulary words from reading one and 
include additional vocabulary. So this is where you're going to do most of your vocabulary work is in read two. Um, include words that may need more verbal definitions. Deepen the comprehension of primary characters and story problems, etc. Explain the feelings or thoughts of secondary char characters. So Peter is obviously a primary character in this story. Um, his mother would be a secondary character. And we'll go into, I'll do a comprehension aside and some analytical thinking about um, his mother's feelings in the story as well. Uh, repeat illustration or scene changes if a book is more complex or necessary for understanding. Continue to model analytical thinking. And after reading, use the follow-up questions to guide children's responses by using text and illustration in order to help connect events. Um, should we pause here and do the second reading or go on to the third reading and then go back? I would do the second reading. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I'm also put it in there. Read demo loud. Okay. <laughs> Read it loud demo. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and do the second read of Peter's chair. So you would have already read it first on a different day. You, they would have been introduced to Peter already. Um, there is a script in the website that we talked about. I like to follow the script. You do not have to follow the script verbatim. You can go over it. You can figure out what you want to say. Um, it's really your preference. I just really like to follow the script. I don't read it word for word. I'm familiar with it and I can reference it if I need to. Um, it is up on my screen because I like to look at it. Um, I'm just going to say the Oops. first the first year we piloted this program, a lot of us actually went through and put sticky notes right in our book yep. so that while we were doing that very first read for the very first time with this group of kiddos and we're still familiarizing ourselves with um, the lesson plans, um, it was just very easy to to have it already in our books while we while we prep that read aloud. I also sometimes just put the discussion questions on the back of the book so that when you're um, asking those are readily available um, or just having sticky notes like Morgan mentioned, you want to go back and reference the illustrations in the text sometimes with the questions that you're asking. Mm -hmm. um, so to have those marked as well. So whatever um, organization strategies work better for you, maybe you don't want to put sticky notes in your book and you are able to just sort of do the script and um, do it that way, that's fine too. Just, I think it's a lot of troubleshooting and figuring out what best works for you. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Did you want to say something? So there's a good question in the chat box that I wanted to ask before we get going on the demo. Um, do you tell your students that they're going to hear the story multiple times? Or how do you handle like on the second, third, fourth read if they say, we already read this? You know, how is that worked through? That's a good question. So I feel like I do in the beginning of the year say, we're going to read this story today. We'll read this a couple more times. Each time you read the story, you're doing something different. Um, and the kids will learn that right away. And then you're going to learn a lot more about that soon with read three and read four are very different. Um, so you'll see that soon. But I will say, this is the first time we've read this. The second time I'll read it, you'll hear in, in the um, introduction, I'll say, we read this story yesterday. Um, and then on the third read, you'll say, we've read this story two times. Today, we're going to do it this way. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, but the kids do know, especially after the first couple of times, they know exactly how many times you're going to read it. And a lot of the times, even they'll know if it's a third read, they'll say, we got to help you read the story today because they know we've already read this twice before. We know what's happening now. And they'll say in a couple of days, we're going to act it out the story. So, yeah, I, I'll piggyback on that. It's, like you said, at the beginning of the year, um, some kiddos are used to maybe only hearing a story once and, and they'll say, we've already done this. Um, but like Morgan said, it's very different. What's cool is that with the repeated exposure to these same texts, sometimes they're asking, when are we going to do cry baby again? Mm -hmm. Or they're getting excited when they see you pick up Peter's chair because like Morgan said, they know what's coming next. Um, if they've mm -hmm. already read it twice, they, then they get to do the third read. Um, so they definitely get used to the structure mm -hmm. for sure. Even when they see a new story come out, they'll say, oh, we have a new story. So 
they're, yeah, they're very um, familiar with it. Okay. All right, so this is what a second read might look like. Make sure you guys can all see. All right, so we have read this book. We read this book yesterday. Um, hold on, my friends. All right, so we remember we read this story yesterday. Peter's Chair by Ezra Jack Keats. We remember that Peter was upset that his parents had painted all of his furniture pink. So he's running away with his blue chair. So his father couldn't paint that chair pink too. So let's read this story again. Peter's chair. So this is where you're gonna to wanna to pay attention to the different ways that we define the words. So we'll start by saying, Peter stretched as high as he could. Oh, there, his tall building was finally finished. Crash, down it came. Shh, called his mother. You'll have to play more quietly. Remember, we have a new baby in the house. So Peter's mother didn't know that it was Willie that knocked down the tower. And Peter might be thinking, why am I getting in trouble when it's Willie that's making all the loud noise? I can see Peter's face and he looks a little upset. Peter looked in his sister Susie's room. His mother was fussing around the cradle. That's this little bed that rocks the baby's sleeping in. That's my cradle, he thought. They painted it pink. Hi, Peter, said his father. Would you like to help paint sister's high chair? my high chair, whispered Peter. And I see a smile on Peter's father's face. So I don't think that he knows that Peter's upset that he's painting the baby furniture pink. He probably thought that Peter was too big to use his high chair any longer. And instead of buying new furniture, they were just going to paint it pink for his sister. He saw his crib and muttered, my crib, it's painted pink too. And not far away stood his old chair. They didn't paint that yet, he shouted. He picked it up and ran to his room. Let's run away, Willie, he said. Peter filled a shopping bag with cookies and dog biscuits or treats for his dog. We'll take my blue chair, my toy crocodile, and the picture of me when I was a baby. And Willie got his bone. So Willie doesn't understand why Peter is upset, but he knows that Peter isn't happy. So Willie is licking Peter's face to try to make him feel better. They went outside and stood in front of his house. Hmm. This is a good place, said Peter. He arranged his things very nicely, or he put them in order, and decided to sit in his chair for a while. But he couldn't fit in the chair. He was too big. His mother came to the window and called, why don't you come back to us, Peter, dear? We have something very special for lunch. Peter and Willie made believe they didn't hear, but Peter got an idea. 
So I think that Peter's mom is happy that Peter didn't run far away. And she must know that Peter is upset because she made him something special for lunch. Soon his mother saw signs that Peter was home. That rascal is hiding behind the curtain, she said happily. Peter's mom thinks that he's being a little rascal or somebody that plays tricks on, other, on someone else. She moved the curtain, but he wasn't there. Here I am, shouted Peter. So Peter's mom thought he was hiding behind the curtain. Peter sat down in a grown up chair. His father sat next to him. Daddy, said Peter, let's paint the little chair pink for Susie. And they did. So I have some questions for you. And when I ask these questions, I want you to think in your head first, think about the question and make sure you have an answer before you raise your hand. I like to make sure that my kids know, like, this is time a time that they need to think about it. I don't want them to raise their hand just because they want to answer, which a lot of them will, which is also fine for certain students. Um, but I want them to really think about the questions. I need them to listen and think and then raise their hand when they have an answer. Um, so here are a couple of examples of questions that you would ask after this um, read. So one of the questions is, why do you think Peter took the picture of him when he was a baby when he ran away? Um, why do you think that Peter wanted to bring Willie when he decided to run away? How do you think that Peter felt about having a baby sister? And why do you think that? And how did Peter's mother feel about him being a rascal? And how do you know? So you're going to listen to the questions. What I like to do a lot of the times is, um, I believe Melissa was talking about this earlier, is when a student answers a question, I will usually repeat the answer back to them so that everybody hears what they said. Um, also, if nobody answers, I'll give them some time. Make sure you allow for a lot of time for processing and thinking. Um, sometimes some of the kids will take a long time to really think about it. Sometimes I will think that kid was not paying attention at all. And then they will answer one of these questions with something that I didn't even think about. And it's like, I, they blow me away sometimes. But um, so if the question was, why do you think Peter took the picture of him when he was a baby, when he ran away and nobody answers, I would allow time for them to think about it. And then I might say, I think that Peter might have taken the picture of him when he was a baby because he's feeling a little bit sad about his parents using his furniture for the new baby sister. And he's wanting his, old, his own furniture or give an answer um, that goes along. But make sure you use that those words like I'm thinking so that they get used to using that as well. Anything? Yeah, and, and you could just go back to that part in the book as well mm -hmm. and show that pic that what's, what's on the front cover yes, actually. Yes, Jesse. But um, when he has his things arranged outside, um, when he runs away, he has his baby photo with him. Um, so when you're asking those questions, going back, go right back to, the, you're right. I usually will hold up the page and ask the question. Mm. All right. Yeah. And you can just, um, after you read those, the, the discussion questions, you can see how these are not uh, one face, one sided questions. Yes or no. What color did they paint the furniture pink? These mm -hmm. are deeper level thinking questions where mm -hmm. um, there's not a right or wrong answer. They can, um, there's many ways to process the, the question. Also, if a student answers a question and it's completely off topic and it doesn't have anything to do with the story, um, I might ask them some other questions that would bring them back to the story. I might say like, what did you think? I might even repeat the question. Um, or if they answer something and it goes along with the story, but it's not quite the answer that you're looking for, I might say good thinking and then I'll move on to someone else. And then I'll have a few kids answer the story or answer the question. And then I'll say, 
something like, I, all of your thoughts were really great. I think, and I'll reiter, reiterate the answer. Right. I think that's important to say is that there's not one person answering one question. If you have six people that still have their hands up, I would let them all answer um, before you move on to another question. All right. So next we'll move on to the third read, which is my favorite read. So this is the reconstruction. Um, so again, like Nicole was saying earlier, this will be a couple of days after you do your second read. Um, this is an interactive reading. So in the third read, children will help retell and reconstruct the story with you. They get super excited to do this. Um, the goal of the third read is to enrich the children's comprehension of the story, continue to model and engage in analytical talk, and introduce or reinforce vocabulary. Um, so introduce the story by stating that you've already read the story and wait for responses on the title of the book instead of providing it. So the first and second time you read the story, you're going to say, this is Peter's Chair by Ezra Jack Keats. The third time I might say, we have read this story two times before, and then I'll hold it up and I'll wait. And then your child, probably not the first or second time, but they will eventually know this is the time that we get to help tell the story so we can say what the title is instead of our teacher telling us. Um, let the children know that you will be retelling the story together, and this time they call out and provide information about the story. I'll go through all of this, and then I'll come back and I'll tell you kind of my process. So before reading, choose parts of the story that you want to read. During this reading, the teacher is responsive to comments and questions. Use phrases such as, we remember, or we know what happened here while pointing to the illustrations. Continue to define words as necessary. Because there is a lot of discussion and explanation throughout this read, there may not be time for inferential questioning at the end of the story. If you do have time for a question, consider a question that will link two stories, which you'll be able to do a lot of later on. Um, so before I start my third read, especially in the beginning of the year, I kind of go over the ground rules with them because this is such a different um, type of reading than the first two. Um, so I'll let the children know this is a time when you actually get to talk during the story. You get to tell the story with us. However, they need to know that one person is talking at a time. So if you have something to say, you're going to wait until somebody else is done. You don't have to raise your hand, but make sure that you're not interrupting. Um, make sure that you're only telling us about what's happening on the page that I'm holding up because you will have some kids that will want to tell you the whole story when you just point to one picture. Um, I always say to, um, if you have just shared something, please let somebody else have a turn on the next page. Exactly. Want to talk about every single page. We want to let everybody else have a turn who mm -hmm. wants a turn. Yep. So you will have some friends who, like Jesse said, will want to tell you what's happening on every single page. And then so we'll tell them, um, sometimes they will be the only one that wants to talk during that read aloud, which is fine, but they need to pause and allow their friends some time to think and um, talk about the story as well. Um, what I usually do, is I will, I'll tell my students, I'm going to start by reading the first page to kind of introduce us and get us back into the story. So what I'll do is I'll read the first page like I did before. Peter stretched as high as he could. There, his tall building was finished. And then I'll turn the page and I'll say something like, we remember what's happening here. And then you wait for a response. And sometimes you'll wait for a response and you won't get any at all. So that's when you might want to start reading again. Or you could say in your own words, oh, I remember this is when Willie crashed into the tower and made a loud noise. But mother didn't know that it wasn't Peter that knocked it down. And she had to say, shh, make sure you don't wake up the baby. Because there won't be retelling the story verbatim. They're going to tell it in their own words. And so you can do a little bit of modeling there as well. Or ask them 
how do you think Peter feels? Look at Peter's face. How do you think he's feeling? So um, you're not reading it word for word mm -hmm. for this third read. You're not reading the text. Um, you're really looking at the illustrations and um, students are, are discussing what's happening. Um, but like Morgan said, go back to the text when maybe you're not getting anything from students or to start the story off to get things going. Mm -hmm. Um, so you're going to do that throughout the whole story. Um, and like I said, if there's a lull, if they're um, kind of going away from the story, then bring them back in by reading a little bit of the text and keep asking them questions like, like Jesse just said, or state like, oh, we remember or we know. And a lot of kids will um, want to keep going from there. Um, I had something else I want to say, but I lost it. At the end of this story, um, when it's finished, you're, if you do have time, you're going to ask the anal analytical questions again. This is when I will stop and I'll say, okay, we were able to tell the story. Everybody, you didn't have to raise your hand when we were telling the story together, but now I have a question for you. So now is the time when I need you and I'll say my whole thing again. I want you to stop and think and raise your hand to answer this question. Because if you don't kind of set that boundary, then they're going to just start answering the question without raising their hands like they were doing throughout the third read. Anything else? Um, I just am thinking back this year I had I had some friends that were quite shy. So for the third read, sometimes it was often quiet. Um, but just knowing your students and like I knew that if I had said um, Addie, do you want to tell us what's happening here? Mm -hmm. Sometimes th she would say no, and I say, okay, does anybody else have anything to say? Or what, um, the tower's falling, or just going back to the illustration. But sometimes if I just said, you know, so-and-so, did you want to tell us what's happening here? And just to get them comfortable with the process, and then later on in the year, maybe they'll speak without being mm -hmm. asked if they want to speak. Um, but it's definitely... They get really excited once mm -hmm. they get used to it, but at the beginning, it's a lot of um, just sort of reminding them about how how this third read works. Mm -hmm. And this, it's just one of my favorite reads because of all of the interaction that you get, and um, you'll have some kids where they might not shine in other areas of the day, but this is their time to shine, and they will say things, and they will remember details of the book that you did not expect to be there and it's just it's one of my favorite parts of the day for sure can you guys talk more about how you manage them if more than one child keeps speaking at the same time yep so melissa just said how do we manage them if more than one child keeps speaking at the same time so that's why it's so important to set your boundaries before you start um and i will tell my students remember if somebody's talking you need to wait um until they're finished and sometimes you will have some students who get upset with that. One of my strategies is always to say in your head, say, maybe next time, um, or whatever strategies you have for helping your students to wait and be patient. Um, but this is, I think, where it's really important to set those boundaries ahead of time before you start the story. Yeah. And I would say them before every time you do a third read. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, somebody starts talking first and then a second child starts talking. And I would just kindly say, um, Sophia, Amelia was was talking first. Can we listen to what she has to say? And then if you have something else to add, I'll come back to you. Yeah, something like that. Was that the question that was in the chat? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yep, perfect. Yep, so just saying so-and-so's turn to talk. Mm -hmm. um, Please wait for your turn and then it will be your turn next. Yep, something like that. All right. So the fourth read, again, is much different than the first three. So in this, um, for this part, children are actually acting out the story. So children dramatize different points of the plot as characters or inanimate objects in the story. They demonstrate their comprehension of the story by using dialogue and gestures the characters would use. Okay, so there's just a sample video. Before we do the video, um, I'll just explain it a little bit more. 
So um, for this part, what you'll do is before this, before you do the fourth read, you want to um, prepare yourself. So in this story, we have characters, Peter, we have baby Susie, sort of, <laughs> um, we have mom and dad. There's also Willie the dog. Um, somebody could be Peter's chair. So it doesn't only have to be people in the story. It can be other objects as well. So you want to think about what, what roles are going to be in the story acting. Sometimes I use sticky notes and I write the roles on the sticky notes so that when I'm assigning roles, I just stick them right on my friends. <laughs> and that helps me sort of guide them while they're acting it out as well. So you want to think about the story, what, what parts are going to be played, whether they're characters or objects, and how you want to assign those roles. So I often um, have my ed tech keep track of who's being assigned roles. So if Morgan's Willie, I want to make sure she's not the main character in the next story we act out so that it's, it's a fair process as you go through. Um, this story, you could act out the whole thing. There are other stories that you'll be acting out and you might not want to act out the whole story because it's lengthy. So you also want to think about, are there certain parts you want to act out instead of acting out the whole story? As the teacher and facilitator, um, so I'll go through and I'll say, today we're acting out the story, Peter's chair. Let's talk about who's in this story. And maybe I'll say, um, can you tell me about the characters in the story? And so they'll say Peter and I'll say, okay, who wants to be Peter? And I'll have, you know, all of them raise their hand. Then I'll assign one role, one person to be Peter. And, and I'll just remind them, you know, if you didn't get a turn today, you might get a turn next time. Um, and students who aren't assigned a role, they'll be part of an audience, which is another learning um, aspect is that you can teach them what an audience does to be quiet and respectful. You clap for the performers and maybe next time you'll be acting. Um, so I was assigned roles um, and then I would just go right into the story. And let's see. So if Morgan was Peter, I would say Peter stretched as high as he could. And if Morgan's not stretching as Peter, I would say, go ahead and stretch your arm up and, and just sort of help them as, as you go through the story. Um, later on in the year, you'll find that you won't have to direct them as much. But at the beginning of the year, may, or, or children that are more shy, you might need to give them some direction. Even, even though they were very eager to assign themselves as a role, sometimes when it's time to act it out, they're like, <laughs> they freeze. So, um, I mean, anything else you want to add to acting out? We can look at a video. I have a video from unit three, which is our wind and water unit. Sorry, the lights are off in the classroom, so it's a little bit dark, but um, this is our story, Rabbits and Raindrops. And you'll see that there are students that are assigned as animals and students that are assigned as, um, there's some at the end that are rainbows or the hedge that the bunnies are hopping behind. Um, so let's take a look. Rabbits and raindrops. Mother rabbits sits by her nest under a hedge at the end of the green lawn. Her five babies are ready to climb out of the nest for the first time. Mother Rabbit hops out into the bright sunlight. 
onto the green grass. One after another, all five of the baby rabbits hop out onto the lawn. They nibble clover and blossoms and leaves. They meet grasshoppers, spiders, and bees. All of a sudden, a, the sky turns dark and big, heavy raindrops begin to fall. Look at the dab. A rabbit. A rabbit's fur is not waterproof. Baby rabbits can become soaked and catch cold. So mother rabbit hurries her babies back under the hedge. From their dry shelter, five babies watch the pouring rain. A butterfly flies in their hedge and rests on a dry leaf. Soon others come inside. I see a hummingbird go inside. Who's a hummingbird? Joe. Joe. All right. Oh, right in. Out in the shower, honeybees buzz by. Mm -hmm. Flying between raindrops to stay dry. Suddenly the shower ends. And the last few raindrops splatter down on the back of the turtle. Colton, can you make your turtle? There you go. All together, the rabbits hop out onto the lawn to taste the wet, wet grass and play rabbit tag in the sun. Look, I'm out. Yeah. I'm out. Go ahead, guys. And you guys can make your rainbow. Nice. All right. Good job, everybody. All right, I know that video was just a little bit glitchy with the video, but the audio was working okay. I hope you were able to see some of them at least step into their roles and um, the two at the end who put their arms together to make a rainbow bridge with their arms. Um, and in this case, everybody was assigned a role. So I was facilitating and the audience, <laughs> but um, you can have a group of students sitting off to the side that are um, that are just the audience and, like I said, just keeping track of who's taking on what roles throughout the year so that you can make it fair for everybody. Does anybody have questions about, we can start questions about the fourth read, um, but really about read aloud in general, any questions that are popping up? And as far as scheduling goes, I always do my read aloud. It's one of the very first things that I do um, that day because, like I said, the rest of the day is going to depend on what you have read. Um, that so day. yeah, you won't you won't be able to introduce centers, mm -hmm. um, introduce painting with paintings inspired by Crybaby if you haven't read Crybaby, right? So um, tomorrow when we talk about scheduling, you want to make sure that read aloud is really. Um, in the very beginning part of your day in order to continue on with intro to centers and centers, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think you've, you've probably heard by now that teachers refer often um, to the core text. And so that's really what Read Aloud is. It's reading the stories multiple times that the program sort of tells you to read, right? They're there for a reason. Um, we're not just picking books off a shelf and reading them because they're one of our favorites. These core texts are really purposefully placed in the program where they're placed. Um, it, it, what, it's not random. Um, all of the texts, if you haven't noticed um, by now with the few that we've been able to share, uh, are, were not written for Pre-K for Me or for OWL for that matter or Boston. Um, they're children's literature that have been some around for years and years um, and others that might be a little newer. They should all be available still for purchase or you can access them through your local library or the main state library. For those that don't know, um, in Augusta on the campus of the Capitol building and the Main State Museum is the Main State Library. And that's accessible to any Maine resident, regardless of where you live. 
So if you go on to their website and sign up or put your information in to be a Maine State Library member, um, you can access books through them as well, and they'll actually ship them to you. So you don't have to travel to Augusta to pick them up or drop them off. Um, it, it's all done via the mail, um, the United States Post. So, of course, if you're in the area, then that's easily accessible as well to so just go to the library and grab what you need. Um, so those are all there as well. But I know a lot of teachers are probably wondering if, you, if they haven't asked already about the other book that we know children love and that us as educators love to read. So where does that come into play? I wondered if any of you could speak to that. I know Melissa touched on it a little bit this morning, but. Oh yeah. Do you want me to? No, no, girl. We can say it better. <laughs> um, so, you know, the first few weeks of school, when you're not yet doing the curriculum, you can read those favorite books of yours. Um, there's four weeks of scheduled program activities um, within it every week. And then there's a fifth week, which is not as much filled with structured activities where you're doing anything you may have missed or an extension of an activity that you'd like to do or creating your own activities, maybe those teacher favorite activities that you love to do with students can go into that week five. Also, there's times throughout the day when you can incorporate those stories. Um, sometimes, especially in the winter here in Maine, when we're not getting outside as much, I'm reading more in the afternoons while we're waiting for dismissal or in between special and like kind of during a transition time. So there's definitely time for all of those different read alouds. We just really want to focus on these 30 core texts. And then also the books that you'll see when we talk about um, Swipple and let's find out about it because there's books in those components as well. I know sometimes um, in the morning when we have students arriving at school, we need something for some of them to do while the rest of them are, are filtering in. So a lot of times we'll have books out on um, the tables for the students to look at and read. Um, you do want to, this is part of small groups, which you'll talk about tomorrow, will. you will, um, teaching them actually how to look at a book and how to read a book. Um, so you can put some of those books out during some downtime. Or in your library. Center. In your library, yeah. A lot of times I know we like to put books in our library that go along with our unit, but that's also a good spot for you to put books that you know that they love to Games read. and holidays yeah. and things like that. Yeah. Um, Nicole, I know you had mentioned about how much we use these core texts, and I would just add that if possible, you're going to want at least two copies of these core texts yeah. because what you're going to do is you can have a copy available in your listening, uh, reading and listening center, your library center. Um, but also if students are making paper collages because they know that in Peter's chair, Ezra Jack Keats used that to create the illustrations in this story, you want this book accessible to them in that center so that they can look through the book and say, oh yeah, I want to try maybe to do something like this with my collage pieces and, and maybe make Peter's tower with my collage pieces. Or um, So you're using the book to introduce the center at intro to centers, but then really the book should go to that center that you're referencing so that students can look through it and have it accessible to them. So we also um, we also gave a list of all our core texts to our librarian. So when she was, you know, when she had some funding available and she was looking for books for our age groupings to mm -hmm. get, she ordered copies of all of our books so that when they were in the library, they could take them out and bring them home and retell them. Yeah, and they get really excited to, yeah. to see them. So, yeah. Oh, transitions, yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was just reading that question, was like, there's a slide for that. <laughs> um, so there are suggested transitions right in your um, lesson plan, thank you, <laughs> that can be used to go 
like as a transition. Exactly. Yeah. So, so these transitions that are in your lesson plans support literacy and language skills, and they're found right in the teacher manual after the read. So your teacher manual, it will have the lesson plan will have read one, read two, read three, read four, read four, and then it will have um, suggested transitions for read one, suggested transitions for read two. Um, so it's all right there for you to use. You'll notice that transi transitions become increasingly more challenging as the year progresses, which makes sense, right? That higher level thinking as the year goes on. So students will begin to, to transition at the beginning of the year by maybe um, the color of their clothing or maybe a little bit. The, yeah, so, um, and by the end of the year, maybe numbers or syllables in their name and ending sounds. So for example, I have Peter's chair, but um, I'll just use this book for an example. Um, if you're wearing the color green, like Peter's overalls, you can go wash your hands for snack. Um, so you're not dismissing them one by one. It doesn't need to be a long drawn out process. You'll notice that um, multiple students are able to transition. Um, so this one says, today I'm going to dismiss you by colors in your clothing. I'm going to find colors in our storybook, like I just modeled for you with this story. Um, this one says crybaby. So if you're wearing something that is blue, like the front cover of the book, you may go do whatever. Do you still have the lesson plan here? Mm -hmm. Just didn't know. I could give an example of later on. In, um, so yeah, you might say, if your name starts with the letter P, like Peter, you can go wash your hands for snack. Um, if your name starts with the letter S, like Peter's little sister Susie, you can go wash your hands and then you might wanna pull up the picture of Susie in the cradle or something. Um, but like I said, they're all there for you in your lesson plan. Oh, you're there. One thing too that I particularly love about the multiple reads and just the texts that are chosen for this program is the connections that students begin to make between the books and themselves, right? So we want to focus on that, those text to text connections, the text to self, the text to life, etc. We want children to be seeing those and making those connections. And when there's an obvious one that they're not getting, feel free to say, do you remember when we read the other book and so-and-so, you know, had a baby or so-and-so had a blue chair, whatever it is. Um, you know, that's really important concept for young children to start to recognize and, and be observant about when they're reading stories. And it happens and it happens really quickly, I would say. Um, like I think, Jesse, you might have mentioned with Peter's chair, it's written and drawn by Ezra Jack Keats, and there's at least two other stories throughout the uh, unit by him. Um, yeah. And, okay. and it's really awesome when you go to read The Snowy Day and you pull up the cover, how many children say, Peter, you know, mm -hmm. or we, that's familiar, or who, do you remember who wrote Peter's chair? And, and they start to remember and they start to make those connections, and it's so rewarding. I haven't even done it. I'm not the teacher in the classroom. You all are. <laughs> So I don't know if I'm speaking out of, you know, context here, but um, I've seen and heard from teachers in the field um, about those experiences happening and how exciting it is for the students to start to make those connections and then start to recognize themselves in their own lives in relation to the characters that you're reading about. Yeah, that's one of the things I was going to say to you, Nicole, is that this, that's one of the really cool things about this program is that they do have a lot of um, authors and illustrators that are, are repeated throughout the program. Um, there's also, I'll talk about when we talk about Swipple, we have another book that we read during Swipple that was illustrated by Ezra Jack Keats. Um, so they'll start to remember authors' names as well. And some, I feel like this year I even heard somebody say, didn't they write that other book too? Um, so that you will talk about your authors and illustrators, like in your first and second read, you'll say the author or the person who wrote this book is Peter, or is Ezra Jack Keith. He is also the illustrator. He also made the pictures. 
So the first and second read, you're really going to do that quite a bit. Um, and kids will start to even remember the authors and illustrators of the stories. So I'll leave it open for any other questions in the chat box or by unmuting. Um, we do have time now too for a 15 minute break. So I'll I'll pause my screen and I'll mute myself. Um, I'll still be right here though, if there's anything that comes up um, and we'll return at two o'clock for Swiftlin or songs, wordplay, letters and numbers. Oh, one other thing I wanted to add, read aloud is another non-negotiable component right. of the program. <laughs> you cannot skip read aloud. Um, it's worth, it's very important for um, to be part of your daily schedule. So a lot of more on that will come tomorrow when we talk about schedules, but I just wanted to put that in. So, okay, do what you need to do. We'll be back formally at two o'clock. Any questions, throw them in the chat box and we'll address them um, as we can. <laughs>